Fantastic. You're all set. Okay. You ready? I am. Okay, I think we're recording, right, Bianca? Yes, yes, we are. Oh, fantastic. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning. If you happen to be calling from the West Coast, um, we're just so happy to have you here with us. Um, my name is Cherry Houston. I'm the lead person on the data um, measurement uh, network response team. And um, the data story webinar series covers many topics related to oral health and data. And we developed this as a learning opportunity for open organizations and members to find and successfully use data to inform efforts in advancing oral health equity. I'm not gonna go through all of that because we only have a half hour and we are just delighted to have um, Steve Geierman, um, who is the, a director within the Dental Patient Safety Foundation. Um, he's gonna share insights and resources about how the dental team and patients can contribute to a stronger culture of safety and dentistry. And I love the fact that he said, we're just gonna have a conversation because this is really a give and take opportunity to discuss some things and really how data can improve these, um, uh, this culture of safety and dentistry. So with that being said, I'm so pleased again to introduce Steve, who is a fellow member of the uh, National Oral Health Connection team with me and has just been a delightful person and wonderful colleague to work with throughout these many years we've been together. So go ahead, Steve, in your own way with your presentation. All right, well, Cherry, thank you. And thank you all for joining us. You know, normally I do have a presentation on a culture of safety and intro, but I will just post that later. That is primarily given to dentists and dental students. And though some of you are dentists, many of you are part are members of the dental team, your dental advocates, or your patients yourselves. And I thought it would be more interesting to be able just to talk to you about the experience we've had thus far about a culture of safety and dentistry. And we can begin a conversation. So when I think about why well, I wanna say something first, when you go to the dentist, for the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of the time, it is a safe environment. So I don't want to cast any assuasions otherwise. But there's something about dentists, you know, we are very sure of ourselves. And the challenge often lies with a mantra that safety committee has learned. We don't know what we don't know. So just keep that in mind. And think about for yourselves, when something bad happens to you and you survive, hopefully, are you just thankful and you move on with your life? Or did you learn something from it and you feel compelled to share that with others so that they don't have to fall into that same pothole? I recently retired from the American Dental Association and I worked for one of the councils that unlike the majority, that look inward towards the dentist. The Council on Advocacy for Access and Prevention, we look outward towards improving the oral health of the public. And because of that, we surrounded ourselves with a lot of experts who were able to inform me as well as my colleagues. And one of those groups was the Medicaid Provider Advisory Committee. And one of the people on this call, Dr. Sid Whitman, hey Sid, wave, there you are. Sid was the chair of that committee for over a decade. We keep the good ones. And during one of our discussions, one of our colleagues in Texas brought up the fact that there was an increase in pediatric sedation deaths in his state. And others shared similar uh, occurrences in their own. And we decided we were gonna look into it. Now I wanna say a culture of safety and dentistry is not just about sedation, though that's an important piece, but it covers a gamut. And there's someone on this call, if I tell a story on them, they were walking through 
a dental operatory one day and tripped over a cord. And that dentist looked at the assistant and said, you know, that's dangerous. And her response was something to the effect of, you're right, you are the fourth person this week to trip over that cord. Now, just treasure that in your heart. Whether it's a sedation death, something that uh, heinous, or tripping over a cord, but not addressing it. So there's a wide range of things that are happening here. Our colleagues in medicine have been refining their own culture of safety for over three decades. And then though, again, medicine is also a safe profession. They drew their attention to this when a book called To Air is Human by Lucian Leap was published almost three decades ago. And I will share that reference later. And they did not make great strides overnight, as I said, three decades. And the ADA has been at this four years. And we still have a ways to go, but it's important for you to know as well. So when we decided to encourage the ADA to look into what it means to support a culture of safety, we actually went to the Council on Dental Practice, and that's exactly what it sounds like. They address practicing dentists in many different settings. And we thought we would be greeted with open arms. Instead, we were told, Dr. Geierman, why are you bothering me? If you continue with this, you're just going to increase the cost of my practice. There will be more government regulations, and you are telling my patients I'm unsafe. So we looked them square in the eye and said, thank you for your opinion. And we went on and did it anyways. It's interesting. And they told us they would fight us tooth and nail. We went to the House of Delegates and got authority to pursue this. And the interesting thing was not a word was raised. It is politically incorrect to say anything bad about safety, but it was safe to say nothing and hope that it went away. But unfortunately for them, we did not. And we've worked four years and I will share some of the good things that we found specifically in two areas. We also were doing this work during the COVID pandemic. And it's interesting because you would think living through COVID, it would have helped move our work forward. And in many ways it did dentist and the dental team truly had to focus upon what does it mean to have a safe dental practice? You know, if I use the word universal precautions, which came into vogue after the HIV uh, epidemic and dentists started wearing gloves, eye shields, and we were basically practicing to protect ourselves from bloodborne pathogens. And for the young people on here, or as a patient, you would never expect to go into a dental office and not see them wearing gloves. But with COVID, we are now faced with airborne pathogens. And that was a whole new ball game. You would ask dentists, how many air exchanges are there within your operatory? And they, their eyes would kind of glaze over or where's the input and the output for the air? And they would wet their finger and feel. And it's like, that's right, we're gonna work with you. And from early on, dentistry actually closed its offices for many months. Uh, we, we actually learned that we don't have to dress totally in spacesuits to treat patients but there are extra layers of precaution. But it's interesting dentists still wanted to stay in their silos. If five of us on here are dentists and we all practiced in the safest way possible, the safest dental vis visit, which is the mantra of OSAP, the Organization for Safety, Asepsis and Prevention, and I sit on their board. And that's all well and good. But consider that the five dentists live in communities where the COVID prevalence at the time could have ranged from 5%, 20, 
30, all the way up to 75. And when, if you think about, we were doing the best we could to maintain safety within our offices, does the prevalence of COVID in our communities have a effect upon how we practice? And the answer is yes. But a lot of, a lot of dental teams couldn't wrap their heads around that. So we're still helping them be aware that we're not silos. We're part of a bigger healthcare team and we're part of a community. It was important for us that we find systems, systematic ways to help protect ourselves. You all know what Swiss cheese is. And if you, if you get a package of 10 slices and you line them up, those holes do not align. They're at all different places. And when you think about developing systems to protect you, if you line that Swiss cheese up one after another, whatever the bad thing is, it may get through the first or the second hole, but something will stop it on the third. And that's the whole idea of having barriers in place. So I wanna tell you about a specific thing that we can do that goes back to that beginning mantra. We don't know what we don't know. Consider flying, even though it got crazy during COVID. I always considered it was safer to fly than to drive a car. And part of that is because when something goes wrong in aviation, a near miss or God forbid, an accident, it is thoroughly investigated. What do they think caused it? What could be done to prevent it? It is written up. And pilots read that like it's the fifth gospel. And you don't have to twist their arm. They want to read it. And that's a really heartwarming thing for me. So when you keep that in mind, the Dental Patient Safety Foundation uh, became a partner with us. Our safety committee decided we were going to recommend to the ADA to encourage its dentists whenever there was a near miss or, or something bad happened in an anonymous and non-discoverable manner to write it up and to share that with the Dental Patient Safety Foundation. They happen to be a federally recognized PSO, patient safety organization, with all the rights and the cautions so that when people report, it is kept confidential, it is non-discoverable. And we take this, the information that is shared with us. We gather similar stories together. Just for example, there were a series of cases where patients caught on fire in a dental chair. And you may be thinking, what the hell was that about? Well, just think about how many of you are comfortable seeing a dentist when you have nitrous on? Laughing gas. Well, you're not getting 100% nitrous or you'd be blue. Blue is a pretty color, but we have to mix oxygen with that. Oxygen is flammable. So you are feeling very comfortable, but your mouth is full of laughing gas and oxygen. I'm using a high speed and I happen to be just smoothing a crown or something and it throws off a spark. Yes, that fast. When I tell this story, a lot of dentists uh, immediately go pale because they hadn't thought about that. And there is the report. And if you were to Google Dental Patient Safety Foundation, you could read about those and about precautions that can be taken. The ADA, at their last annual meeting in Las Vegas in 2021, we passed a resolution that simply said, the ADA encourages all dentists to uh, report in an anonymous and non-discoverable manner near misses and adverse incidents so that others can learn from your experience without having to experience the bad thing themselves. That has been almost 10 months ago. 
How many reports do you think the Dental Patient Safety Foundation has received from dentists? Exactly, Sid, none. And it's not because dentists are bad. I will tell you, being one, dentists are human. We do make mistakes. But dentists are also fearful. And, you know, unless you're working in an FQHC, a federally qualified health center, Bureau of Prisons, Indian Health Service, maybe in a DSO or a large group practice, but many dentists still are working in private practices, one or two uh, provider practices. And they are fearful of litigation. They, they feel uncomfortable being transparent and sharing data and information with the patient who was harmed and their peers. And it's very interesting because we realized our colleagues in medicine, nurses, pharmacy went through the same thing. And we were lucky. We were, we were put in contact with a group in Washington State at the University of Washington. They're called the Collaborative for Accountability and Improvement. They are largely a group of lawyers. They've been together over 20 years and they have helped physicians, nurses, pharmacists embrace transparency and not just in a theoretical manner, but in a practical manner that they can actually use the skills, communication skills about conflict and resolution to be able to share with their colleagues. And for the last almost six months, representatives from that organization have been working with the ADA. And I will also share uh, links to several of their webinars. When we did a webinar on when bad things happen in dentistry, over 2,000 dentists signed up the first time. So, I mean, people want to hear this. And Cherry Houston is thinking, what does this have to do with data? It's all about sharing. And sharing information, if you hold it to yourself, nobody learns. Many dentists think, I can't, I can't possibly share this because they'll sue me. Well, I'm a University of Michigan grad and at the big University of Michigan hospital, and we're talking huge system, the general hospital, children's, cancer, women's, multitude of different hospital entities. They made a conscious decision to be totally transparent when bad things happen. And they held themselves to that uh, standard and they kept really good records. And DE2118, you should mute yourself. Otherwise, otherwise your crinkling of paper is not helping. You are so good, you get a prize. So what the University of Michigan was able to show a 59% reduction in liability and suits just by being upfront with their patients. And patients appreciated that. And what we're doing uh, with our culture of safety is actually doing a series of educational modules to help people role play. How do I talk about these kind of things? But I think the most important module will be one that's called just in time. If I was treating Cherry and something happened, I extracted the wrong tooth. Yeah, I could just send her home and hope she didn't notice, but it may be the case where I could actually take 10 minutes and actually review this just in time video that refreshes my memory about how do I address this? How do I remain calm? How do I support the patient? And my example with Cherry is actually not far-fetched. One of the 
examples that we used in our training was someone who was having teeth extracted for a, a partial denture. And we were, I was going to remove, figuratively me, uh, the first and second lower molars on this side. And I was sick that day and a dentist, someone else came in, looked at the treatment plan, but they took out those two teeth and they took out the premolar in front of it. And, you know, in their mind, that just made sense. That premolar was going to be the abutment or the anchor that the partial denture was going to be uh, built upon. So that's a real life story that we had to address. So what I'm saying to you all is we have a long ways to go in developing a culture of safety. We need to help people feel at ease. And that means members of the dental team. If you see something, say something. Like when you're at the airport and you hear that announcement. But of course, you don't just blurt it out in front of the patient in a manner that's alarming. It's like you take the dentist aside and it's like, did you see? And then together, you move forward and you address that. And it is a learning experience, but most, but most patients are actually understanding. They're human as well. So if you see something, you say something. You encourage your patient to, to express their thoughts. You know, we, we often talk about patient surveys. We could learn a lot from those. We need to be patient with ourselves. We need to build trust. And we need to encourage our staff not to be fearful, but to speak up. We did a survey, and I'm almost finished, so we'll have time for questions. We did a survey of, of a, a focus group of dentists, and we asked them, about their feelings and experience about a culture of safety. And one of the most striking things was that 100% of them said, if something bad happens, we need to address it. But 93% of the dentists said they felt unprepared to be able to have the resources they need to address that situation in a timely manner. And that's what we're striving for. So being able to, when something bad happens, to be able to write it up in an anonymous manner, and that's not just dentists, anyone can submit an anonymous, non-discoverable piece of information, data to the Dental Patient Safety Foundation, and we will pursue it. So, on the open network, I will post more uh, links for you to get more information, but we have about seven minutes left and I just wanna open it up uh, for questions. I have not looked in the chat to see if there's anything. There is just an evaluation form. Say something nice about Cherry. So and- uh, Follow the chat, um, Steve, uh, uh -huh. to field any questions and- uh, you're right, there's no questions. But you know, we've had wonderful discussions when people just chime in and what have you. I I'll, I'll start it off. Um please. Just um of course you you had mentioned um, I'm over here wondering what does this have to do with data? And then um and as I'm listening to you, I'm picking up all kinds of data related kinds of um uh, insinuations or questions or content or what have you. And one of the things I was wondering, are, are you all considering the reports that people are calling in anonymously as a, a, a data method or mechanism? And if so, how are you um, calculating or, or uh, collecting that information? Well, to be honest, Cherry, we're not getting a lot of it right now. And that's why I was thankful when I offered to do this talk that I could bring this up. We are, and we are actually trying to share this information wherever possible. Uh, Sid is the chair, 
Sid Whitman is the chair of the New Jersey Oral Health Coalition. We've spoken about it there. I've spoken about it at the National Oral Health Conference, and I'm the uh, incoming chair of OSAP, the National Dental Safety in Dental Infection uh, Safety Prevention Organization. Uh -huh. And we're making it a piece of our, our uh, platform as well. People are not comfortable right now. And, and I'll just end by saying, medicine has been at this 30 years and they're so much better than us. If we, if we put dental aside and we look at oral health, dental's asylum, it's something I do with my fingers, but oral health is part of the bigger picture of overall health. Then we're partnering with our physicians, nurse and pharmacist friends, for example, and we can learn from them and that transparency. And many dental schools and hygiene schools, they're actually starting to educate themselves with others, other disciplines. Hannah had a question, would you like to do a seminar for the AGD? Of course. Uh, so what is Terry, AGD? Uh, the Academy of General Dentists. And we actually did a three-year, uh, not a three-year, we did a three-hour intro to a culture of safety. And that's one of the resources that uh, I will share with you all. These are all on the ADA website, but they're in front of the firewall. If you, if you go to ADA CE online, it'll ask you to uh, create an account. It's free. Go ahead and do it, and you'll be able to access all this safety information. I will also point out to you, if you've never read the journal of the California Dental Association, stellar. But in, I want to say 2019, there were two issues, July and September, totally dedicated to a culture of safety and dentistry, stellar articles. And I will post as many of those in open communities that you'll be able to embrace those. Okay. Are there- Can you speak there... to, um, unless somebody else has said something, but Lori Cofano um, had, uh, yeah. had a comment in the chat box um, around the uh, suction tip um saying that this is a safety issue can you speak to that a little bit in terms of um uh in terms of how, you know how does the patient know to to think about things like that or how what would the patient say to the dentist don't use that or well, what? Uh, patients patients don't know if i were to ask you cherry hey i'm new in i'm new in tennessee i need a dentist and you were to tell me well i like doctor Switzer Nadasti, but most, most people recommend dentists. They don't have a clue about their technique. They know that they're nice. They don't hurt them. They're cute. You know, all those things all fit into, but knowing if, if a suction and water lines are clean, people know about that because when bad things happen, it me it gets on the internet and in the papers. Okay, but this That's is a, specifically to her point, especially the end of it, how many are cleaning and disinfecting the suction between patients? I mean, is that something that um, a, a hygienist or somebody like you or somebody that know about these safety issues can collect data on or inform the public on? Um, I mean, if we can relate this back to data a little bit, how would you use that Point, for instance, I do will, you collect data around that? We do. When bad things happen, there were there were waterline issues with contamination most recently in California. They've also had those in Georgia, and they hit the papers, and people start doing what they should have been doing in the past. So I want to say, don't paint with a broad brush. If there are 100 dentists, 95 of them or more are doing the right thing. There are five that need a good slap, and we need to figure out who those five are. But the more you can educate yourself, it's like if I was a pregnant woman 
having my first kid, I don't have a clue. And I have to listen to grandma and my own mom. But by the time I have my second or third, I'm starting to know what I should be looking for. Uh, you know, Lori's question is very specific. And you should be. People clean out their water lines after each, at the end of each day, but you have these devices that you don't basically get, you know, spit back up, you know, into it. It's like when someone drinks out of uh, the bottle of milk rather than pouring it in a glass, I don't want backwash in it. That sounds gross, but it's, it's that's what she's talking about. Okay. And, right. and there are ways of addressing this. Okay. And I will, I will put that in there. I will put you. that in the place as well. I appreciate uh, I'm, the I'm opportunity. I'm assuming Sharon. that, um, yeah, it's, it's, our time is up, but I'm assuming, and maybe this is a poor assumption, that when companies create or make these devices, do they have recommendations to the dentist about cleaning these devices and oh, disinfecting yeah. the suction between patients? Yeah, exactly. They do. Okay. Anybody and else? I, um, I'm I just sorry. put my email address okay. in, uh, in there. People have questions. And Lori just said a contributing factor is lack of consistency across training institutions regarding safety concerns. And so maybe and that just, needs to also be another data point too, or that's where you collect data on. Oh, it is. And is. Yeah. part of it, Terry, is let's just say dental and hygiene schools. Most of them have very strong safety programs. They protect the patients, the students, and the institution. My question to them is, did you teach them enough that when Sid, Steve, and Cherry graduate and we go three separate ways, and if we have to start a program from scratch, did they teach me enough to know how to start a safety program? More than just, did I run uh, a spore strip, you know, once a week in my autoclave to make sure I'm not growing something. There's a lot more to safety than just meets the eye. Okay. Well, if nothing else, Cherry, yeah. I hope that I raise some questions. I see lots of people that I know on the call who actually are also great resources. And I would encourage you to visit OSAP, O S A P dot org for some excellent safety information and and I would encourage you uh, to actually consider joining OSAP. Uh, membership fees are actually very minor. Oftentimes your organization will address it. Okay. But thank you for all for the great comments. Cherry Houston, you are so gracious to invite me and <laughs> I hope that I uh, did you did you well. Thank you, Steve. Really appreciate it. So stay tuned for our last um, data uh, series, uh, the last of our uh, uh, data stories. And uh, I think we had, that was one we needed to reschedule because they had to cancel. But thank you again, Steve. And thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate you. Have a great afternoon.